Please be seated. Well, it's wonderful to have you all in church today. Is it okay if I put that there, Krista? As we're concluding our series entitled, I Quit, but I want to give you a little bit of a highlight for what's coming up with our next series. But first of all, be here Wednesday at 6.30 for Ash Wednesday. Ash Wednesday is a really cool church tradition. You won't find that term in the Bible, but it's a really church, cool church tradition that began centuries after Jesus, where Christians kind of celebrated the, the inauguration of Lent, the beginning, the beginning of the season of Lent, which is the 40 days prior, prior to Easter, which you'll learn more about that if you come Wednesday. So I'm going to leave you a little bit thirsty for an explanation for a little bit more of the history. You're maybe not thirsty for the history, but it doesn't matter. I'd love to see you Wednesday at 6.30 as we kick off Lent, as we begin our walk towards the cross and the empty tomb and our risen, resurrected Savior and conquering King Jesus. Our series we're starting next Sunday in Lent is on a book of the Bible that I personally have never, never preached on. I probably should have by now. But what's interesting about this book is it's, it's the only book in all 66 books of the Bible that doesn't mention God, which is a little bit weird because I, you kind of think, isn't the Bible about God? And he's not, he's not mentioned one time. And this book also is the only book in the Old Testament that's not referenced in the New. Every other book in the Old Testament is referenced in the New Testament except this book, and it's the book of Esther. So we're going to be going through Lent looking at the book of Esther and I guess not talking about God at all. But no, it's, God is all over the place, and this is one of the lessons that we need to learn in our life as we walk with our, in our Christian walk, is that we don't need to always have eyes on Him. I mean, we do need to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, but we don't need to always have where it, it always seems like He's at a quick answer to every prayer. He's always at our elbow. He's vivid reminders of His presence. There's times where God calls us like He did with Jesus to go walk into the wilderness. Because remember, after Jesus' baptism, it said, who led Jesus into the wilderness? He didn't choose to go into the, into the desert to be tempted by the devil. It said he was led there by the Holy Spirit. So there are times and seasons in our life where God's going to say, I'm, I'm, walking you into the, I'm walking you into the desert, and it's not going to seem like I'm anywhere around, but I'm there, and I'm still doing mighty things, and I'm still directing your life, and I'm still working things for my purposes. That's the book of Esther. He's not mentioned, but he is mightily present and still working, which is a great lesson for our our life. But today we're concluding our sermon, our series entitled, I Quit. And there's lots of stuff we need to quit. Um, some of you need to quit, maybe quit smoking, quit drinking, you know, quit smoking, snorting, drinking, whatever it is. Some of us need to put that stuff away. But there, there, and you do. Stop looking at porn, you need to quit that stuff. But there are other things deeper that we need to stop doing and we need to quit. Closer to the, close, closely more, more related to our, our walk with God. And these things that we've been looking at the last three weeks and concluding with our fourth today are things that are inhibitors. They're, they're, they're God blockers in our walk with Him. So week one, we said, the, the I quit what? Making excuses. That is that where you are in life and where you are in your career and your relationships, it's not His fault. It's not the teacher's fault. It's not your parents' fault. It's not the coach's fault. It's not my spouse's fault. And until you begin to own, take ownership of your life and who you are, you're never going to find peace, you're never going to find joy, and you're never going to feel the fullness of what God wants for your life until you own it, until you take responsibility, until you quit making excuses. And then the next week we looked at I quit complaining. You know, God doesn't like complainers. If you look at the Exodus when the, He brought him out of the, His people out of Egypt, they started griping, I'm hungry, I'm thirsty, I'm this, I'm that. And at one point, God even napalmed the outskirts of the camp. <laughs> outskirts of the camp. He carpet bombed them. So if anyone's if, because of their complaining. So when you come to church and you're, well, why do we sing that? And I had the co I didn't like the coffee, which is which I thought was really good today. Why? What, I don't understand this. Don't be on the outskirts of the church because you might get <clears throat> you might get napalmed by God. But God does not like complaining, and it, it comes to its full manifestation when He says, finally, you don't want to go in the promised land? Fine. You want to complain, 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 and He views complaining as a sign of not trusting Him, which it is, that, he, that God doesn't have your best interest, God doesn't have your future in mind, God doesn't have love for you, and you complain. God can't provide. He has no provision. That's why we got to complain about being hungry or being thirsty or, or whatever it is in our life that we're complaining about. 
You're saying that here's an area where God's, God doesn't have ownership or provision over my life. And that's a sign of unfaith. All of these are signs of unfaith, especially the third one we looked at, which is I quit living in fear. And fear is one that is so common in a sense that, so common in a sense that it has wrecked so many of our lives, that we have missed out. I don't know. I mean, you know, I could look back on my life, you remember, and, and the opportunities that maybe God has put before me and to do mighty things in someone's life, have the Holy Spirit work through and do mighty things, but I was scared, you know, and, and, or maybe someone has stepped into a lifestyle that is antithetical to God's will for your life because you were scared just to say no. You were scared to say, no, I, I, to take a stand, and you just kind of go along like a cork in the stream. That's fear. And remember last week we looked at those 50 people over the age of 90 and they had, they had those three, regret, three regrets. If they had to do it over, what would they do differently is they would, they, would, they would risk more. That was the top of the list. They would risk more. They'd take a chance. They wouldn't just sit passively and let God's will for them go by. They would risk more. And that's... I quit living in fear. You look at the lives of the apostles before the resurrection, or, or should I say before Pentecost, what was it? A life completely dictated by fear and their own personal safety. What did life look like after the Holy Spirit came to them at Pentecost? Completely unafraid. Completely undaunted, detached from themselves. Nothing could even, nothing, nothing could get in their way. Nothing stopped them. Nothing that they were fearful of. I mean, even thrown to the point, you should go read some of the early accounts of the Christian martyrs, and it is just absolutely almost excruciating to read how the Roman emperors and the, or the Roman Empire in different times and persecutions of Christians, how they put those people to death. And all these people had to do was renounce their faith, and they would have, they would have, been able to escape death. They were fed to animals. They were gored to death by wild boars. They were roasted over spits. I mean, the most unimaginable, horrific ways. It's like, it's like the end of Braveheart where William Wallace dies. Do you remember that? And it's just like all the horrible things you could possibly think of to kill someone. That's how they kill Christians. And they, they went to those things with a song in their heart and no fear. Why? And, and then asked another question. Why aren't I like that? You want to know why? Because why, why we need to drill down on I quit. We need to quit living in fear. Quit making excuses. Quit complaining. Is because we just have too much of the world in us. That's what it is. There's just too much of ungodly. There's just too much of the world in us, and we were too attached to the world, which is why we got to quit this. And this, is, this is, leads us nicely what we're going to look at today. The last thing that we need to quit. The first three, I've always had, I've had people say to me, and they can admit that they're making excuses, because I've had people in my office and counsel people, and they'd say, you know, you know, it's, it, you know, it's my parents' fault. They never did this for me, and my, my mom was so this, and my dad was neglectful, and he was never home. And, and you could get people to say, hey, maybe this is your fault. Like, maybe this isn't mom and dad's fault. Maybe, maybe you're the reason you're you. I mean, that could it possibly be just that. And I've had people say, you know, you're right. I, you're right. And I've had people admit that they're complaining. I'd be like, can I share a concern? And usually that's, especially in a church, I mean, that's just basically saying, can I moan right now and murmur? It's like when people come, they come to you and they say, you know, with all due respect, they're about ready to say something disrespectful. So like, no, don't give me with all due respect. But I've had people say in admittance, ah, you know, I am murmuring, I am complaining, I got it. I got to stop that. And I've had people admit that they're fearful. Yeah, why didn't, why didn't you take that job? I was afraid. Why didn't you step out for that opportunity? I was scared. I was scared. But I've never had anyone admit this one that we're going to talk about today. Not once. So this is going to be hard for you to quit because you won't admit that you have it. And this one that I'm talking about has 
Shakespeare says, has a tendency to hide itself. You know, the other three are pretty obvious. This one is a little bit cloak and dagger. This one's a little in the shadows. All sin tends to work that way. Remember the first time sin is mentioned in the Bible is Genesis, in Genesis 4. It's not Genesis 3 when they're in the garden. It's Genesis 4. It's the first time the word sin occurs, and it's with Cain and Abel. Or with Cain, and God says to Cain, remember, sin is crouching at your door. Be careful, Cain. And you've got to realize why God uses that metaphor. Why does the Lord use that specifically? It's crouching. Sin crouches because what crouches in that culture or in any culture? Anim- predatory animals, right? And why do they crouch? So they could pounce. But what? there's a second reason, and probably more important, why does an animal crouch down when it's about ready to pow- pounce? Why? To stay hidden. And what is God telling you? Cain, there's a sin that's crouching at your door, and you can't see it. And the sin that has you by the neck the most is the one that you could see the least. And that's, this one probably has us by the neck, a good chunk of us in this room, all of us at one point in our life. Me, quite often. And this transcends gender, this transcends race, this goes across all spectrums, rich, poor, whatever. And as a matter of fact, this particular thing that we need to quit is one that's even mentioned in the Big Ten, not the football conference. What am I talking about? The Ten Commandments. And depending on how you order them, it's the one at the end. And God says, let's use the old English, thou shall not, what? Covet. And what's a modern word for coveting? We're going to say today, comparing. I quit comparing. We don't have an English word for covet, I mean, for what the Hebrew word is there, coveting. We don't have one. My son was asking me yesterday, Dad, what's coveting? And I said, well, it's really wanting something. And he said, so is it bad to want something? And I go, well, no. And I said, well, it's needing. And he goes, so if I need something like food, is that wrong? And I go, well, no. Uh, um, we don't have a word. We don't have a word. You know why? Uh, because we're not... I think 21st century Americans were not in tune with our hearts as much as the Hebrew people were, or much as the people of the Bible were. We have as much psychoanalysis as possible in our day and age, but we don't know our hearts half as well as we think we do. And it's like the Eskimos. How many words do they have for snow? Um, There's like 11 different words for snow that the Eskimos have. Why? Because they're constantly in it, and they know it so well that they could see the nuances and the distinctions between different types of snow. Whereas, look at us down here. How many in North America and English, how many words do we have for snow? Snow! That's it. There's snow. It's like in the South. I never understood this about the South. There's a lot I don't understand about the South, but, but I mean, I like it. My brother lives down there. He says, Dan, you know what they love down there? He says, it's, it's God, America, and football. And I'm like, those are all three of my jobs. I'm a pastor, I'm a football coach, and I'm in the military. It's perfect. Um, but I can't stand the weather down there. But I've never understood about the South of you that every soda is called Coke. Have you known that? It's like, we'll get a Coke that's Sprite, we'll get a Coke that's this. It's like Coke that, that's how we are with our language, with with wants. We don't have a word for covet. Like the Eskimos have a word for snow. We don't have, they could see the distinctions. The Hebrew people can see the distinctions between a need and a want. There's a difference between a need and a want and coveting or envying or comparing. And it's hard not to compare in our culture because we're in a constant comparison trap. Our culture is. You can't walk through the grocery store. You cannot check out. And I mean, as a man, you're looking at these magazines and everyone's scantily clad as you're walking to check out. It's it's unnerving. Where you're constantly constantly comparing yourself to who's the most beautiful, who's the most attractive. Guys, social media is the worst thing, that is the worst perpetrator of this crime. I mean, I look, I try not to do it, but when I look through Facebook or look through Instagram or something like that, and you look at what people are posting, you're like, I'm like, dang, everyone's life's better than mine. Like, look at that. We were just in Hawaii. Why does Hawaii look so much more fun for them than it does for us? They're having a great time. And I, my kid, when we were there, my kids were screaming, you know, I was having to go to the bathroom and peed their pants. I mean, 
what, what do they know that I don't know? You know, you scroll through and you're like, I'm a loser, I'm a loser, I'm a loser, I'm a loser, I'm a loser. Do, do you want to know why? I mean, because you're constantly in a state of comparison. You know where else you could be in a state of comparison? You could be in a state of comparison with people's expectations of you, a parent. I mean, those don't go away easy, you guys. And they live deep down with, and they're operating principles on our heart without us knowing it. Dad wanted me to be this. Mama was prayed for that. And here I am, and I'm not getting closer. Here I am, or I've made it. Either way, makes you, you're still in the comparison game, even if you make it or if you don't make it. If you make it, you become, con- you become conceited that you're still living by, you're still letting your life be dictate by, dictated by the comparison. And if you don't make it, the expectations, you're still letting your life and your striving be dictated by the comparison. We're constantly, or I mean, or a friend that's more attractive than we are, or more successful than we are. The Bible calls that coveting. You could call it envy of the seven deadly sins. You could call it comparison. But either way, it comes down to one basic concept. If you look at Scripture, in Philippians chapter 2, this now, mind you, where the Apostle Paul is writing this letter. Philippians was written while Paul was in jail. He's not sitting in, he's not sitting by the pool. Paul's in jail. And in chapter 2 of this just wonderful, wonderful letter of the Apostle, He begins in verse 1, he says, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united in Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and mind. Now, drill down right here. This is verse 3. Now, hear me. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Now, that word right there, Vain conceit is another word, the word that we really find difficult to translate. The old King James was, do you remember this term, some of you, vainglorious? We don't say that anymore, so we can't translate it that way. But it literally means someone who is uh, completely, and, and, and it makes sense considering what comes after that, which we're going to read in a second. It means someone who's completely and utterly empty that they're constantly looking in, in so many places to find, to be filled. They're empty. And I, like Augustine and C.S. Lewis after him, believe that every person on the, on the planet has a God-shaped hole in their heart. And that God-shaped hole or vacuum needs to be filled. And it's the reason why we have, there's a restlessness to us. There's a a constant search for joy and contentment. It's that God-shaped hole that we have in the heart that's always looking for meaning, something to give us meaning, something to give us purpose, something to give us significance. And the typical human does not want to put God in what was the God-shaped hole where he should belong. We want to put anything and utterly everything else. I mean, sex and money and career, and we think those things satisfy, and that's why we keep jumping from the next to the next thing, to the next thing, to the next thing, to the next thing, to the next thing. It's much like my teacher at seminary called, uh, when you try and fill your life up with things other than Jesus Christ, life tends to be a lot like uh, Bazooka Joe bubblegum. How many, is, do they still make Bazooka Joe bubblegum with the cartoons? They do? I know that, like hubba bubba, whatever, it doesn't matter, whatever your, whatever your bubble gum is, juicy fruit. You pop that bubble gum in, and it tastes really good for like five minutes. And then what? It gets, it gets hard, it gets a little bit, like, gross, and after about five, ten minutes, it's not like extra, that bubble gum's nasty after about ten minutes. And you go, you spit it out, and then if you were like me when, as a kid, I would just say, there's another one. I chew on that for like 10 minutes. Here's another, spit it out, chew on that, chew on that, spit it out. And what's happening? My body is really craving something else. My body's craving nourishment. My body's craving real food, but what am I giving it? I'm giving it, I'm giving it bubble gum instead of real food. And this is like us. Your bo- 
if the Bible's true, and it is, then Jesus Christ is the thing that your life is craving for the most, and you're chewing bubble gum. You're messing around, like C.S. Lewis says, with, you're messing around with like food and career and, and sex and relationships. He says, when infinite joy is offered you. Infinite joy. Do you remember Lewis's quote? He says, we're, we as creatures were far too easily pleased. <laughs> like, we get satisfied with career and food and relationships, he says, when you've been offered infinite joy. We're, we're too easily pleased. It's not that our desires are too strong. Our desires are too weak. <laughs> and, we're, as, and as a consequence, we're empty and look at the, the, we're vainglorious. We're God-starved. We're God-starved. And we think coming to church is the solution to that? I mean, you could come to church all you want, but until there's an actual encounter with Jesus Christ and something in, and the Holy Spirit comes into the heart and there's a difference that we don't go to church, that, church, that Christ isn't a part of my life, that as Paul says in Colossians 3, when Christ who is your life appears, why do you think he makes that dis- distinction? There's a, do you think there's this distinction that has someone that has Christ a part of their life? Like I have things that are a part of my life. Lots of things that are a part of my life. The Bible says Christ is to be your life. That there's a difference, isn't there, Bruce? There's a difference. I can't even see you because it's very light up here. But I know that voice. Um, but when you're in that state of comparison, guess what? Jesus Christ can't be the operating principle of your heart when you're in a state of compare when you're constantly comparing your life to something else, because you want to know why? That's a state of self-justification, that you're saying that what justifies, what brings purpose, what's going to bring you? Righteousness and redemption is if I could level up, you know, if I could be better than, if I could be prettier than. And guess what? Scripture says, who's the one who justifies? Who's the one who makes right? What is it to justify? To make right, to set right, to, get, to, give you, to make you righteous. Who does that in the Bible? That's Jesus Christ by his death and his resurrection. And when you're in a state of comparison, in essence, what you're saying is, I don't trust that. Here, Dorothy Sayers, uh, she has a great quote on, on envy <clears throat> and God-starved people like us. She says, um, envy is the great leveler. If it cannot level things up, it will level them down. If I can't get myself above her, if I can't make myself get to a point where I'm successful in the eyes of my dad or in the eyes of the crowd or in the eyes of my wife, if I can't get myself leveled up, then I'm going to level things down. Because I can't, I, can't I can't take the loss. I can't take the, the disappointment. I can't take it. So if I can't get myself leveled up, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to level you all down. And that's called sh- Schockenfreud, right? I think that's the German term, where you're happy when your team, when someone else loses. Have you ever felt good when someone else loses? No, 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 no. Yes, you have. Yes, you, yes, you have. I was just going to bring that up. Because I hear people all the time, well, I hate the Patriots. I hate the Patriots. I hate Tom Brady and his hot wife. I hate the Patriots. I hate the Patriots. Do you want to know why people say that? Because you're, let's say it with me together, jealous. You are. I'm sorry. We've won one Super Bowl. They've won like 87 in the last 10 years. <laughs> we're jealous. Do you, and, and when they lose, do you know, where there's something in us that kind of is like. <laughs> Seriously, you know, like when I see teams that I don't like lose, the Oregon Ducks, <clears throat> when I see them lose, there's a sense where I'm like, yes, yes. <laughs> If I can't level up, 
you know what I'm going to root for and I'm going to try to do? I'm going to level things down. That's what comparison, that's what envy does. And can you imagine a more like sinister position of the heart? Can you imagine a a heart that operates under that principle? I mean, it's one thing to joke about sports teams, but it is, it's another to, to maybe be jealous of a sibling or someone at work that it's, everything just came, seems to come so easy for them. You know, there's a, how many of you have seen the movie? It's from the 80s, uh, Amadeus, about Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. There's two main characters. One is Mozart, obviously, but the other was... Um, the guy who was basically the, the most famous musician in all of Germany before Mozart, which is a guy named Lesser Known, and here's why. His name was Salieri. And Salieri worked so hard at his musical talent and worked and worked and worked and made a, made a bar- bargain with God. He says, if I keep my nose to the grindstone, if I grind and I do this for you and I do this for you and I do this for you, will you reward, reward me with notoriety and being known as the greatest musician? And so he grinds, you guys. He works and works and works and works and works and works. And God is rewarding him until suddenly comes along this lout, this little flandering, non-practicing, non-working pervert named Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. And he is unprecedented in the history of music with his talent doesn't work at it, doesn't revere God. And Salieri is just crestfallen at this. Not just crestfallen at his, at his, his sense of worth being devalued, but he also now says, you, to God. We had a deal. I worked. I prayed. I went to church. I said ten Hail Marys and all the Our Fathers. I did, I did everything right. I did everything right. I did everything right. And you gave me the, and this guy does nothing and he's a pervert and he violates your law. Flout, he basically flips his nose at your, to, to your face and you give him everything. Well, Salieri can't take it. And listen, at the, at, there's one section. You guys, this is, it gives me the creeps just to read this. But there's one, one section at the end where Salieri is there and he realizes he's not going to level up over Mozart. You follow what I'm saying? He's not going to level up. So what's the option then? Level him down. down. And this section is really creepy because here's Salieri and he's sitting in front of a crucifix and it's as if he's talking to God and he's sitting there and he's scowling. He doesn't look like he's happy. He's scowling, looking at the crucifix and he says to this, says to the crucifix, in essence to God, from now on, we are enemies, you And I, says it to God, because you have chosen for yourself as an instrument a boastful, lustful, smutty, infantile boy, and the only ability you've given me is the ability to recognize his ability, that incarnation of God-given ability incarnation, God in the flesh. Because you are unjust, unfair, unkind, now catch this, I will block you, he says to God. I swear it. I will hinder and harm your creature on earth as far as I am able. I will ruin your incarnation. What is that? Coveting. Leveling down. Coveting. Envy. Comparing. Why wasn't Solieri just content with what God had given him? Why wasn't he content? Because he was comparing. C.S. Lewis, who's my patron saint, Lewis says, um, pride gets no pleasure out of having something, only having more of it than the next man. We say people are proud of being rich or clever or good-looking, but they're not. They're proud of being richer or cleverer or better-looking than others. In other words, what? Envy, 
and comparing. Now, do you see, it's not, it's not, a, it's not a bridge too far to see how this is a, is a God blocker to your heart. It's a grace blocker, we should say even more so. That this blocks grace. That it's, it's an operating principle of the heart that maybe we don't know about that is, that is utterly captivating us and has us in prison. That's why one of the scriptural images of sin is bondage. I mean, that, I would say if we're stuck in a comparison trap from our parents or from our kids or from our wife or from our job or from whatever, that comparison trap is just that. It's a trap. It's bondage. It's a prison. Okay, so the text tells us briefly, how do you get out? If you want to get out, but you have to want to get out. Some people like being in prison because then they could still make excuses and complain. Well, Philippians 2 tells us, this is utterly amazing, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, being empty. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. By the way, what's humility? C.S. Lewis says, humility is not thinking less of yourself. Oh, this old thing? It's not thinking less of yourself, it's just thinking of yourself less. How do you get to a place where you could think of yourself less? Well, you who are empty need to get full. And what's popping into my mind right now is that woman from John chapter 4, do you remember the woman at the well? She's a Samaritan woman. She comes to Jesus Christ at the well at noon. Who goes to a well at noon? Hashtag no one. And she comes to the well at noon. And why does she go at noon? You're going to find out. Jesus is there because it's scorching hot. No one, everyone goes in the morning or in the evening, not at noon. And she comes to Jesus Christ, and he's, he basically says, if you would have asked me for a drink, I would have given you my living water, and you'll never be thirsty again. And she says, I'd like that. And he, Jesus Christ, in the greatest non sequitur in the history of the world, says, go call your husband. Okay, Jesus says, I want to give you living water so you'll never be thirsty again. He just told me to call my husband. What, what in the world does that have to do with anything? It has to do with everything. Because he says, if you want my living water, there's something you need to quit. Huh? And this woman had made male affection the idol of her life. And he says, go call your husband. And she tries to wiggle away. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have a husband. I, you know, I have no husband. And Jesus, don't try and wiggle away from Jesus. Like, number one, he's got your best interests in mind. Why do you want to mess with someone and try and push someone away that has your spiritual best interests in mind? Why do you, want, why do you not want him to have you? That's first and paramount, foremost. But secondly, uh, he kind of knows everything anyway, so there's no real point in trying to wiggle away when there's nowhere to wiggle away to. And she goes, I have no husband, and Jesus says, I know, you've had five. You've had five, and you're cohabitating right now. So that makes, you're, you're with a boyfriend and cohabitating right now. That was in an honor-shame culture, mind you. I mean, f- having five husbands even now would be kind of shameful. But back then, can you imagine the shame that was on that lady because she had five husbands? It's unreal. She must have been the absolute outcast of outcasts. To top it all off, well, she was a woman, which made her second tier anyway in that culture. And then she was a Samaritan woman, which made it even worse. And then she had five husbands. Can I get lower? Five husbands. And, And she was cohabitating. I mean, this is the bottom, bottom of the garbage. She's at the bottom of the trash can. See why she came out at noon? Why? I don't want to see anyone. I can't stand the, sn- the sneers, the looks. I get it. I get it. And you know what? And it's pr- my fault that I'm here and I'm getting these, I just, how do you deal with that self-shame and self-guilt and communal shame and communal guilt? I mean, like, that's a, you could see why people will get to the point where they'd want to take their life. You, you, could, you could see. And Jesus says, you've had five. And then she says, um, I see that you are a prophet. 
<laughs> a little more than that, because at first she calls him sir. That's earlier on. And then she says, oh, you're a prophet. And then she says, I know that the Messiah, when he comes, he'll tell us all things. And he says, that's me. And then it says, she went back to the town. This is, and this is super cool, so don't miss this. I always miss this when I read this story. I used to. It says, she went back to the town after one encounter with Jesus Christ. Mind you, she went back to the town and to the people. That's different now, isn't it? Remember, she was trying to avoid. Now she's not trying to avoid. She's trying to go into the middle of them. And it says, then, leaving her water jar, the object of her shame, why she had to come out at noon, because of who she was and her past and all the... And one encounter with Jesus Christ, and what does she do? I quit. I quit. I quit living up to. I quit this, my past, and I have to... New, all that, I quit. And what happens? She goes back into her town, and it says that Jesus went back and stayed with them, and the town of Sychar, many of them, Sychar, many became believers in Jesus Christ, and they said to the woman, we no longer believe because of what you told us about him. We have seen for ourselves that this man is, now listen to this closely, the Savior of the the woman who was avoiding everyone converts everyone. Is that amazing? If you quit, Jesus Christ can give you living water, but you gotta put your water, you gotta put your water jar down. You can't have Jesus and your comparisons anymore. You can't have Jesus and your water jar. And that's why look at what Jesus, the rest of the chapter two makes sense as we conclude. It says, have the same mind that is in you, that is in Jesus Christ, who being in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be exploited, but rather made him, emptied himself, made himself nothing, taking the very form of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in the appearance of man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name, this is one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible, the name that is above all names that at the very name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue conf in, in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Do you want to hear something that's super cool that's going to rock your world? Um, do you want to get rid of that God, God starvation? You need to be filled with his fullness. That's the key. How do you get, how do you get filled with this fullness? Uh, I was looking at my notes. You have... You have to see what happened outside of you and use it inside of you. You're God-starved, and so if you're starved, look at the one who is full and emptied himself. That's how you get full. You keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, and you surrender each and every moment of each and every day, and you look to be filled with him. So when the comparison trap comes up, and it will, this stuff, the, 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 the complaining, the making excuses, the living in fear, the comparison trap. Guys, that never goes away. So get comfortable with that coming back at you and coming back at you and coming back at you. It's going to be there your whole life. But here, this is why the Bible says you need to have weapons of the Spirit. You just don't sit there and say, oh, I hope it ends quickly. No, you, you, you keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. So when I'm in a comparison game, oh my gosh, I got that to do and I'm not gonna, make, I'm not gonna get promoted and what's gonna happen and what's gonna, no, 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 no. Jesus Christ is my life. Jesus Christ isn't a part of my life. Jesus Christ is my life and I surrender to him right now and his kingdom come and his will will be done, not my will. Okay, and then you're gonna like five minutes later at work and it's gonna hit you again. You're like, no, Jesus Christ is my life. Christ is my life. This is what scripture means in 2 Corinthians where Paul says, take every thought captive to the word of Christ. Every thought goes into the, goes into the prison that is known as Jesus' dungeon and nothing comes out of there. Nothing gets to operate under your heart above him. That's why Paul says, look at you who are God empty, look at the one who is God full and emptied himself. Look at someone who doesn't play the comparison game. Did Jesus Christ, holy smokes, was Jesus Christ in a state of coveting and vanity in comparison when he had thorns put on his head and mocked as a king and, and hit in the side of the face? It says, and they continually struck him. 
and beat him with reeds, and he had thorns about his head, mocking him as a king when, when he was being scourged, scourged practically to death, when he was hoisted upon the cross, and historically we know that they hoisted people not with a nice little loincloth, but they hoisted them naked, and the victims often befouled themselves, and they did it covered in his own excrement on the side of the road with everyone to see with a sign of complete mockery above him that says, ho, 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 here's the king of the Jews. Do you think he was worried about his reputation? Huh? Do you think he was worried about comparing or coveting or envy? No. Huh? We're trying to climb up and look at Jesus Christ. We're like two ships passing in the night. He's coming down. You look to him. Here, I'll re- and we'll conclude with this. <clears throat> These are just my notes from this week, and I just want to read it so I get it right. <clears throat> you and I are killing each other and killing ourselves, trying to fill ourselves with glory. Jesus was full, and he voluntarily, voluntarily emptied himself of glory. <laughs> We can't comprehend how beautiful, full, and glorious he was. He was full and he emptied himself. He lost all his glory and went to the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was eternally and utterly ignored. He was cut off. He embraced our worst nightmare to be eternally and utterly ignored. And in that you find life. In that we find hope. In that we find peace. In that we find the core reason why I stop comparing. I quit. So just say it. I mean, you could say it audibly. You could say it in your mind right now. I quit. I quit comparing. I'm sick of living my life like that. I'm sick of being imprisoned. I quit. I quit. And Jesus Christ is the only one who could fill that God-shaped hole. So let him fill it. Let him speak truth into your life. Go call your husband. Let's talk about your career, Dan. Let's talk about that relationship. Let's talk about what's going on at home when no one sees. Let's talk about that. Sorry, I went a little long, um, and I want to honor your time. Um, but we're going to, are we, are we singing, Annie? Yeah. Let's sing. Um, and I'm going to pray for us. Sorry about that. I got a little, I want to pray for us. We're going to sing, and then we're going to take communion during the song. The offering is going to come up as we collect our tithes and offerings. Tithe at our church we teach is a 10% first fruit. Offering is anything else above that. But we believe in giving uh, first fruits to the local ministry where we're fed, which is our church here, Emmanuel. Um, So we encourage you to do that. Um, And we're going to sing. And as we we hear this song, Faithful to the End, I want you to, uh, in your mind, know that the one that you're the one who came from heaven is gonna be with you to the very end. And listen to these words as we contemplate, I I quit living in fear, I quit complaining, I quit making excuses, and I quit comparing. Father, uh, bless us this day. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you took the nails for us, that thorns around your head, um, naked and, and suffering and dying on the cross for us, that that may be our identity because you rose victoriously from the dead on Easter that now death has been defeated, the king is alive, that death no longer has dominion over you, and if we're in you, that means death no longer has dominion over us. And so that there's nothing, if you are the king of everything, that there's really nothing, to, no other comparison we need to make to anything else. The verdict's already in for who we are. So let us rest securely in who we are because of who you are. Let, let, let us take every thought captive, Lord Jesus Christ, to your words, your beautiful, sweet words. And let us know that in you we have life and life to the full, living water that will always quench every thirst our soul has. And Jesus, we pray this in your strong name. Amen.